really uh, an honor uh, to be here. That opening that you did this morning was so beautiful. And what uh, permeates it is these values of respect and humility. And those are the values, folks, that we're really going to accelerate on this journey towards eliminating harm. My uh, delight here is uh, a really special, special place, place in, in my heart, heart uh, because when we were struggling to get the U.S. to engage in this collapse work, as you know, early on that we had successes, but it was hard to get by. And uh, Jan, you in New Zealand were accelerating and leaping to say, hey, this is good stuff, let's go put it in. And really, in many ways, I used you, you may not know it, to push the U.S. to further scale this effort. So I'm uh, indebted to you. And we're delighted to share further where we've gone in the journey. We are quite uh, enthusiastic about the approaches that we've led, but we alone can't scale it for the demand that we have. And so we're ecstatic about our partnership with, with EY, who shares our values, who shares our purpose, and is being driven together. Stories are the most powerful force for change. You, you know that w w with your people. They either pin you to your current performance or they propel you to new pinnacles because stories define how we act in the world. Stories whether I see myself as fit or fat. Stories like JFK, I want to put a man on, on the moon. And in this case, stories of Roger Bannister when he broke the four minute mile. No. I'm a runner, so I happen to be fond of that story, although my EY colleagues have been keeping me so busy, it was hard to get a run in the last couple of days. But context for you, in 1954, Roger Bannister, as a medical student in Oxford, was the first person to break that four minute mile. And at the time, leading scientists told him, you will die trying, it is not possible. It stood for 2,000 years, no way is it happening. And you probably know Bannister broke that record. What you may not know is the next year, this supposedly lethal record, 12 more people broke it. The next year, 156 people broke it. And now high school kids across New Zealand and the US and the globe are routinely breaking it. And the only thing that changed was their belief system. And because Bannister broke it, he freed us all to break that four minute impossibility. And folks, what we're here today to do is for us to collectively think of some new stories for New Zealand, for the world, and I hope like you did with Clamsey, you pushed the world in your efforts. And the stories that I believe are holding us back are three. Number one, that harm is inevitable rather than preventable. We say those words, but if we really believed it, we would be acting differently. Number two, that quality is a project rather than an integrated operating management system. That we still play whack-a-mole on the thousand different things rather than seeing this as an integrated whole. And third, safety is based and quality is based on the heroism of our clinicians rather than the design of safe systems. Now, I'd like you to write the words, I will down, I will. Because though I'm delighted to visit your amazingly beautiful country, and I've already texted my wife and daughter saying, we have to come back here for vacation. The trip here uh, isn't just to meet friends and colleagues, and, and no doubt we will. The trip here is that you do something with this stuff afterwards, because what the purpose that we have here is so sacred. So I'd ask you to think about how you might continue those. Now, some of you may know our Clabsy work, but I'd like to briefly just share with you our journey on this, because it's a journey like so many journeys that began out of personal shortcomings and, in my case, failures. You see, in 2001, on a snowy night in Baltimore, in a darkened corner of the ICU, this little girl, Josie King, who was born days after my daughter and looked, looked hauntingly similar, was taken off of life support and died in her mother's arms. 
She had been burned and then developed a catheter infection and died from that. And at the time, these infections, you may know, killed more people than breast or prostate cancer. I mean, just uh, pause for a second to think about it. Clabsy is one little type of harm in all of the universe of harm, but it's a public health issue the size of breast or prostate cancer. And frankly, besides your leadership, it didn't get that kind of attention. But that was what we accepted as the cost of doing business. We just said harm is inevitable. You care for sick or old or very young people that sometimes... Little girls, like Josie, are going to die. And she did. Her mother started working with us and challenged me and said, Peter, could you tell me that this will not happen to my other daughter? And I said, no, I can't. Our rates of infection at the time were sky high, and I was one of those doctors causing infections. I didn't want to. No clinician does, but I was. So I said, I, I can't give you an answer, but we'll work to do it. So what did we do? Well, we started declaring a goal of zero infections. At the time, it was a bold, bold statement. My critical care colleagues thought I was off my rocker. We made a checklist of best practices. We made it easy to use the checklist. We encouraged doctors and nurses to break their silos and work together as a team so nurses were empowered to stop the doctors putting these catheters if they didn't use it. We fed data on infection rates back into the system. We created structures that doctors and nurses could learn from doctors and nurses, hospital from hospital, state to state. And now, with the whole lot of effort, these infections are down across all of the U.S. by 80%. It, it's one of the few, maybe the only example that we have across our country that says, here was our performance before to err as human, that report on safety, and now we're confident that we have a dramatic reduction. And so it offered us an opportunity to say, why did this work and what might we learn from it? So we borrowed a tool from the nuclear industry, a tool called peer-to-peer -peer review, where one healthcare organization goes into another, and not with any regulatory or sanctioning ability, but solely to learn, to see what, what went well and what we could glean from it. And so we visited those hospitals that were zero and those hospitals that weren't zero. And we're happy to share this methods. And the visit was very structured. We interviewed the CEO. We interviewed the medical director. We interviewed the infection prevention person. We interviewed the ICU physician and nurse manager. And then we just walked around and talked to staff. We collected our notes and we shared it back with the teams. And what did we found? Well, we found that to be zero, it wasn't magical. It wasn't just handing out a checklist as if it's Harry Potter's wand. But there were a very set, explicit, group of management practices that if they all occurred, they were zero. The first was that the leaders declared and communicated a goal of zero harm. If you walked into that hospital and I asked the executive, what's your infection rates? And they said, oh, you know, Peter, I think we're doing pretty good on that. My, my ICU directors got that, or my quality directors got that. Guarantee they weren't zero. The zero one was that executive said, my goal is zero. I tell every staff in orientation it's zero. I communicate it in all my messages, and we've been 500 days without an infection. Not surprising they're zero. The ones that were zero, the leaders created an enabling infrastructure to support the frontline workers. That is, they broke the silos and provided project management. They provided improvement science. They provided data. They provided training and skill building for the, those tasks. The ones that were zero engaged their frontline clinicians and connected them in peer learning communities. And the ones that were zero transparently reported and created accountability mechanisms. That is, somebody looked when you weren't performing well and asked why. But that was at the organizational level. We wanted to go deeper and say, but what went on in the hearts and minds of these clinicians? Because as all of you know, Change is really an intrapersonal thing. It happens when that doctor or nurse goes that extra mile or the executive. And we wanted to know what transformation led because this was a rare event, at least in the U.S. And when we interviewed staff, we brought our anthropologist and our sociologist in, and I spent a lot of time talking to people, you could see in their eyes what they believed in their heart. That is, they started telling a new story. Routinely, all the doctors and nurses said 
Peter, I used to say harm is inevitable and I'm just a nurse or just a doctor. I can't change this big cog. I feel so unempowered. And through this effort, I started telling a new story that harm is inevitable, is preventable, I'm sorry, and I am capable of doing something about it. So we dug deeper and said, well, what does it take to lead that transformation? Because if we could all start telling new stories for all of New Zealand, imagine where we might be. And what we found is that those new stories happened for two things. Number one, somebody believed in the staff that they could. They believed in them. And you created structures for belonging, that structures that allowed for that peer learning community. The believing piece, and I know you live this, but is really key, and it goes back to our humility and respect. When we first started this and we're trying to spread it, the message was never, look how good I am or we are at Johns Hopkins. That would have demotivated others. The message has to be, look how good you could be. We believe deeply in you. Heck, if we can get that, you can get your rates down. Look how good you could be. The second was these structures for belonging. Because so often in quality, we viewed it only as process. But we didn't have structures for peer learning where doctors and nurses could learn from others, hospitals and hospitals. And so we built those structures. Now, we felt pretty good about that effort until I met the mother of another little girl who lost a child from medical errors. Her daughter died from elective orthopedic surgery. Uh, while narcotics infused into her, she stopped breathing. If there's any engineers in the room, it, it's almost, uh, not almost, it is unacceptable to think we give medicines that are lethal that have a known side effect of making you breathe slower. We have monitors to count your breaths and those two things don't talk to each other, right? Our pilot's not here. You would never dream in any other industry of tolerating that, but we do. And we buy those equipment not being allowed to talk to each other. So she said, Peter, why is it fair that you could look at Sorrel King in the eye and say, Josie's less likely to die, but my daughter died the same year Josie did and is just as likely to die today. It's still happening at an alarming rate. We walked away from there, and I was quite troubled because nothing humbles you like the mother of a daughter who died. And I said, team, we're thinking about this wrong. This is not the way we're going to solve this problem. If you put a satellite up into space, and it can blow up to 15 reasons, and it didn't blow up for reason one, call it clabsy, do you think they'd pat themselves on the back and say, oh, well, the satellite blew up, but, but that number one reason didn't, 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 didn't get us. Another thing got us, right? Of course, they'd say, what are you, delusional? It's about zero harm. It's about the mission going well. We have 15, 20 reasons why people are harmed in healthcare, <clears throat> and yet we haven't taken this integrated approach to do that. So we said, well, what might it take to do that? And we turn to this literature of high reliability organizing. You see, in healthcare, we've gone through these waves of the first wave is kind of technical advancements, largely around training and skill building. So if you graduate a training program as a surgeon, you likely know how to cut and sew reasonably well, right? right. As an OB doc, you know how to deliver babies. As a pediatrician or your nurse, you know how to do your role. And that got us so far. It's a key in health system development, but it's not enough. Second wave was process changes, like our checklist. Yes, we do it, and you've done brilliant work here across New, New Zealand. But again, that's still playing whack-a-mole for individual harms that come up. The third phase, the phase we are just beginning on, is this idea of high-reliability organization, where we pay deep attention to behaviors of frontline uh, workers. This idea of respecting each other so that we're comfortable questioning each other when, when we see risks that inevitably happen and really focus on culture and structures. Now, what are these high reliability organizations? Well, our risk gentlemen in front of us could, could enlighten us. They are organizations like inland firefighters, like aircraft carriers, like the nuclear industry. 
and they perform with remarkable degrees of safety despite living in dynamic and really, really hazardous conditions. And they do it, there's a lot of theory around it, but let's boil it down to some simple concepts. They do it by operating by two logics, two logics. Logic one is anticipate and prevent mistakes by standardizing work whenever you could. So they standardize everything from executive roles to board roles to unit level roles. Logic two is they recognize they're never going to be able to standardize everything. Healthcare is too complex, patients are too varied, so they build resiliency among people to recover from those mistakes that will happen inevitably. And that resiliency, it turns out, may actually be more important in healthcare than preventing mistakes. Second thing these organizations do is they have two preconditions for being able to live those two logics. Number one is a profound respect for everybody in the organization. And by profound, I mean profound. The second is they have a culture of hunger to learn, to always ask, and how can I be better today? What can I do differently to improve? This idea of building a habit of habitual excellence. But that only comes about if you begin to see quality and safety not as a project, but as this integrated operating management system. Let me share with you an example of that type of thinking. I was visiting an aircraft carrier to study this, and I was uh, really what I was there for was whining about how hard it is to do this at Johns Hopkins because we have residents who change all the time, and our patients are sick, and we have a lot of very different types of procedures. And the commandant cut me off and said, Peter, stop whining. Let me share with you our environment. We have a ship the size of a football field. It's out in the open seas pitching at 40 degrees, uh, and we land planes every three seconds with enough bombs to kill us all on it. And they have about a foot error rate towards the end of the runway before the hook catches them and they go off. And by the way, we change our entire crew every six months, and the average age is 18, and they have a high school degree. So stop whining about your residents and how complex you are, and start leading like a high reliability organization would. I was speaking with him, and I was standing next to a gentleman sweeping the deck of the aircraft carrier. Because as if you know, if there's a rock or a debris or a bolt, they have such little margin of error that could cause a plane to crash. And I looked at that gentleman and asked him, what job do you do? Well, what job do you do? And his response was profound. He didn't say, I sweep the deck. What he said was, I help planes take off and land safely to serve the mission of the United States of America. Right? I then went back and asked my environmental services workers, what job do you do? because they help us prevent MRSA and C. diff when they clean the rooms. And they didn't say, I help keep patients safe. I prevent infections. We're working on it. Many of them will now, but at the time we didn't. You see, your role as leaders in this high reliability journey really boils down to making sure that every employee in your organization would answer yes to three questions. I am treated with respect every day by everybody I interact with, regardless of my role, my race, my power structure. Number two is that I have the resources I need to do my job. When I looked into the training that we provide our environmental services for C. diff and MRSA, it was pathetic and embarrassing. We like, like neglected them. We wonder why our rooms sometimes were disciplined. We didn't have standard work for that approach. Number three is that I am recognized for what I do by somebody that matters to me every single day. So what did we start on this journey? Well, we said, okay, let's start designing a health system that eliminates all harms. We've known we could take one harm and exploit it globally. What if we were to take one health system and eliminate all harms? And so we started with a very clear purpose to help people thrive to prevent disease when possible, to cure when we can't prevent, and to care when we can't cure. We also realized we're going to need some very different behaviors to drive this agenda, behaviors that I am humble, curious, and compassionate. 
then I respect, appreciate, and help others. And I'm accountable to continuously improve myself, my organizations, and my community. And we said, how might we take these two principles and preconditions and make it real? Well, the way all of these organizations do it is through something called an operating management system. Quite simply, what it means is how do you integrate your governance, your leadership, your technology, your human resources, your training, all into one seamless whole to achieve that purpose. Not whack-a-mole, but integrated. And we started with this really humbling exercise of doing a map of our governance of our health system. We, like you, are quite complex. But we asked the question, does our board quality committee function with the same discipline and rigor as our board finance committee? We started with that, and the answer was, are you kidding me? Not even close. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, we know in healthcare, if you look across hospitals, or even if you look across geography, there's some variation, but it's relatively small. But we know within the walls of a health delivery system, there's six to, fold, six to eight fold more variation by units, by departments, by clinics than there is looking across your health systems. We don't look all, we look a little bit different, but the magic is finding those pockets where you have harm going on. We do that for finance where you can map a dollar anywhere in your complex delivery system and it flows up to one P&L statement, right? Somehow we make that oversight work. And if any one of those little nooks and crannies misses their budget, whether it's a nursing unit or a cl clinic, somehow someone knows about it and is looking at it. So the question is, could you say the same thing about the quality and safety? Our answer was no. So we started mapping our health delivery system. You don't have to use this map, but we literally said for our ambulatory practices, where are we delivering ambulatory care do each of them have a standard dashboard and do they cascade up from the individual clinician to regions or the other places so that we could begin to make sure we have accountability for this? We also said that just like you would in finance, if you can't name the directly responsible individual at every one of those le levels, you do not have an accountability system. So could we begin to say from board to bedside, who is that point person? They obviously work with the team, but who's coordinating the quality reports to drive this agenda from anywhere that, that you go in your organization? And we had a standard way of reporting performance, a standard way that though the measures vary, all of the, the categories are the same. We use six categories, just this, this so it fit on one page. Safety, which are our internal risks, which are really important. Performance on external measures, patient experience, value, and then the other two are healthcare equity and population health. Healthcare equity meaning, are we giving the same results by, to all of the patients we serve regardless of race, ethnicity, sexual orientation, primary language, whatever that might be. And for all of our projects, we use that same framework that we learn drives zero infection. So leaders' jobs are to create that enabling infrastructure to serve frontline clinicians. It's kind of flipping the pyramid. Yes, we create accountability and responsibility, but that goes to as close as the bedside as, as, as possible. And we, as leaders, simply create this architecture to allow this work to cascade. And to build this, we use this eloquent structure of nature called a fractal. They, it, I, this, I think, is going to be the management concept of the 21st century. Fractals are ubiquitous structures in nature. They're what a fern is, or a tree, or a snowflake, or a riverbank. And fractals operate by simple rules. They have mathematical formulas. We're not going to give you a math formula, but our simple rule is this. Every higher level of the organization needs to create a structure, a meeting, where every lower level has a voice at the table to co-create the future. Because we know change progresses at the speed of trust, and trust is broken when we do things with rather than to people. And so often in the last decade of quality, we would give a decree that you're going to use this checklist or something's going to happen, and we somehow magically thought it was going to be adopted, but there was no way for teams to co-create. And we use words like scale and spread. But those are all words that imply 
power over people, not power with people. The words we use now are let's co-create what we're going to do together. Let me give you an example. Many people say, Peter, could I see the checklist that you used for this work? It seemed like it worked really well. I chuckle and say, there's thousands of hospitals that did this program. There's thousands of versions of the checklist. Intentionally, we said, do not use the Johns Hopkins version. Now, they're all 90, 95% the same. So they didn't have to start from scratch. But that 5% flexibility is what makes it work. And every one of theirs thinks theirs is the best. And it is for their culture and context. It wouldn't work if we imposed it on them. But we often don't have structures for that peer learning. You see, this fractal structure allows us to create why we had a collapse reduction. That is, it creates a structure to tell a new story of believing and belonging. We have horizontal connections for peer learning. So I say, oh, what are you doing at this meeting? We have vertical connections for accountability. So how does this play out? Very concretely, let's take a hospital, for example. A hospital would have a quality meeting where all the department leaders are there sharing the results. The department would have a meeting where all the divisions of that hospital are there sharing the results. In ambulatory practices, the same thing. We would have all of the places we do ambulatory. We have about 86 places, too many people for one meeting. So what do we do? We add a new branch. We break it into regions. We have the regional leads all there co-creating. The regions then have the individual clinics. And through this, we could address and create accountability to a, a, a make visible that six to eight fold variation that we're not giving population health. So some very real example. When we do this, we found in the hospital, our pediatric surgery measures went nowhere. You see, the adult surgeons didn't report them because, oh, they're pediatrics. And the pediatricians didn't report them because they were surgery. And they literally just, there was no accountability for it. Same thing in our amatory practices. We monitor HEDIS measure, these population health measures. Some of them we did well on, like our diabetes, the adult ones. But the ones that involved PEDS or OB, we didn't do well on. Why? Because most of these ambulatory clinics were adults, and that required the integration of PEDS or OB. But now, through this, it was visible. And we have an explicit accountability model built into this, just like you do for finance. What does that mean? It means once we agree on a measure, if you miss your mark by one quarter, the local CEO or who's ever at the head of this branch has to write what their plan is and send it to our Johns Hopkins Medicine Committee. If you miss it by too much, the two months, the local board chair has to sign off on it and you present at our meeting about what you're doing about it. At three months, our team goes in and investigates and does a peer-to-peer -peer review about why you're missing the mark. But we do it with this idea of shared leadership accountability. What do we mean by that? We mean that every higher level in this chain will only hold a lower level accountable if they first hold themselves accountable to maximally set them up to be successful. That is, this isn't about shaming people, it's supporting them. So that higher level leader has to ask, did that lower level leader know the goals and their roles? Did they have the resources, the skills, and the time to succeed? And did they have the feedback mechanisms to drive improvement? And if those answers are no, then it goes up to that higher level leader. And it may be we can't afford it. It may be the measure's not good. But at least there's a conversation to say, you didn't set your people up to do the job that we did. And this is a radical kind of inversion of the pyramid of leaders as servants to support those frontline clinicians and putting the responsibility but also the accountability at the front line. And if those two need to go together, so that there has to be the support, but once you support them, department director, division director, you own the, this issue. Now this work is really complicated, and here's how we organize it. Again, I, population health didn't fit on the slide, but let me just share with you some of what we do. Under safety, we group our work into three areas. Risky providers, we have them unfortunately. Risky units and risky systems. Why the safety is so important is we, like you, report an ever-growing number of measures to external regulatory agencies. Indeed, Johns Hopkins Medicine, I'm responsible for over 1,200 measures, 1,200. Yet when I ask our clinicians, what are you most worried about? 
Very few, if any, of those 1,200 measures are on their list. They're much more worried about the internal risks. And so we, we, our problem was we were devoting all of our resources to playing that test and not on internal risks. So we now have ways to recognize and address those physicians who are untouchables, or not just physicians, who create a culture of bullying and disrespect. And we have a very disciplined way of either coaching them or removing them from position of powers. Secondly, these risky units or cl clinics. There's great data that units or clinics that are low on employee engagement, that are low on patient experience, and that are low on safety culture have much higher mortality and cost than those that are, aren't. And it makes sense. I mean, if your staff aren't happy, your patients aren't happy, and people say the culture stinks, you have a sick unit. But we've never proactively identified them. So now, it's only once a year that we get these data. We get the data, we triangulate where they're low, we send the department director or the clinic director to where that unit maps a memo saying this unit was identified as a risky unit. We will be presenting by name these risky units at our next board meeting. I'd like to meet with you to get your thoughts about these units, but mostly for you to present what plan you're gonna be doing to change these risky units because rest assured the board will be asking what you're doing about it. Right? In almost every one of these, it's been a leadership challenge and we've now done 91 of them. In 89 of them, we've had huge improvements in, all, in the safety culture and engagement simply by proactively looking within the nooks and crannies for this. The risky systems, it's something you might think about in New Zealand. When we look at risky systems, and these are things that are non-rate-based, and I won't bore you with the methods, but things like handoff errors that are really hard to measure, medical device safety. HIT errors, which are increasingly a huge issue, patient identification errors, uh, medication errors, falls. What we found is that when these events happen, health systems would put a team together to address it. The team would disband, and then another event would happen again, and they'd put a team together. So now for all of these that we call the enduring risks, we have groups across all of our health systems that meet regularly, and their job is to find best practices either at Hopkins, in the literature, around the globe, do a gap against those best practices, and narrow that gap continuously. So they report repeatedly, where are we going with these, uh, with these efforts? I want to spend a few minutes, though, on our value work. Actually, before I get to that, let me just go through those gray boxes because it's really key. If you're going to flip this pyramid and put the accountability and responsibility on frontline staff, you need to support them. And at least in the States, we haven't supported them. And to do that, we needed to break down silos. There was no new budget for this. We simply had to erase the walls to say, okay, hey, lean people, or your PDSA people, your quality people, we need you to leverage and focus on this. We need marketing and communications to tell those stories on our team. Yes, we have a communications plan, but we're gonna move an FTE from your budget into the Armstrong Institute to support them. We need analytics and researchers to do this. And and for example, our finance people didn't trust that anyone other than finance knew how to look at the cost data. And they may have been right, so we said, okay, that's fine. You could own it. We're gonna take one of your finance analysts, move them in the Armstrong Institute. You could say, you could have confidence that they do it, but I want to give one-stop shopping for our doctors and nurses. So when they say I want to measure, they're not going to send to eight different places to say, oh, the cost data is here, the quality data from the EMR is this person, the other patient experience data is this. We will serve them with one-stop shopping as a front end and make it easy for them. The backbone of this work, though, of that respectful uh, improvement effort is the microsystem improvement team in the units that we call a CUSP team. You see, every one of our units now across Johns Hopkins, every one of our clinic, every home care group has these local improvement teams. And we link them in various ways to get handoff errors, to get service lines, but they know their local risks in those units and they uh, focus on it. We also did, and, and it may be the first we've seen, is defined an explicit curriculum or capabilities for quality and safety as a health system level. That is, if you're going to be an operating ma management system, what skills do you need? Not just, oh, go to this PDSA course, but we defined it, and we have 44,000 people, of what are the core competencies that every employee in our organization needs to how to give respectful, safe, 
patient-centered care. And it's some interactive e-learning modules that we now have HR policies to support. Second level is what are the competencies and skills if you devote some but not all of your time to quality and safety. So this might be a nurse manager, a clinic manager, a division director. We have a lot of these people in our organization, indeed several thousand of them. We've never had standard training for them. The highest level is people who devote the majority of their time for quality and safety. And again, what are the competencies that we need to have? And we also link these to harm prevention competencies. Let me give you an example of what, a, it's a brilliant demonstration of this operating management system. We recently had a blip in our clabs. He sent shudders through my spine. And what we found was that many of our nurses who were coming out of orientation, we had high turnover, didn't know the basics of catheter maintenance. Right? Surprisingly, they didn't know the basics of catheter maintenance. And you say, how is that possible? Well, the people who run nurse orientation were separate from our quality and safety people. They did their orientation people, and indeed, they cut the time for infection prevention and orientation. Why? Because they had to train on our new EMR system and all this other stuff that they had to do. But it wasn't geared around zero harm. So what did we do now with our nurse orientation and our residency program? We listed the top 10 reasons people are harmed. It's not hard to do. And we said, you will make sure that when our nurses come out of orientation, they have measurable competency in preventing th these harms. You, you can own it, but we have to be aligned on this zero harm journey. And it's been breathtaking. And by the way, docs, those harms that you list are the same ones as nurses list. So why don't we work together and have a joint competency thing you know, together? But it shows you once you start viewing this as an integrated whole, you break down a lot of these silos. So that value stream, I want to share a few minutes about this really magical work that we're doing that you might consider here called clinical communities. You see, when we dug into the Collabsy work, I mentioned it was that belonging to a peer learning community that was the magic sauce for telling a new story. And so we said, and we call those groups, those peer learning communities, clinical communities. What if we exploded that concept and launched many of these communities across Johns Hopkins Medicine? We're a large health system, and could we begin to change that narrative in a much more global way? So these communities are self-governing teams. They're led by clinicians from an academic and our community hospital. There was some disrespect that our academics had for the community docs, and so intentionally they require to be co-led to, to show respect for our community doctors. The Armstrong Institute provides that enabling infrastructure that I showed you earlier, and they work on our purpose, but we trust that they know where the harms are of what they want to work on. We now have 40 of these we can't keep up with the demand. I mean, that sounds silly, but think of a program where your doctors and nurses are asking for more improvement teams than you can keep up with, rather than you saying, I need you to go work on this. Some are geographic based, like all of our ICUs in the system, and you have an amazing ICU program across Australia and New Zealand. Some are hospitalists, some are PACUs, some are service line based, hip and knee replacement, depression, diabetes, those all cross uh, geographic locations. Some are topic-based, like transfusion, palliative care, patient-centered care, our patient family advisory council. We don't really care. If we have a clinician who's interested in something, we launch it to support it, because we recognize that if we're going to be this HRO, we need every, every one of our employees coming to work every day saying, I have two jobs. The job I was hired to do and a job to improve the value I provide to patients. So we bring these on, and it's messy. Now, how do we finance this? Well, we finance it with supply chain savings. You see, supply chain costs are really low-hanging fruit. We've grossly overpaid from, to the vendors from our prices, and we charge 5x variation even within our own health system. Our finance folks were working on supply chain, but guess what? The docs really didn't want to hear what the finance had to say about what hip or screw to use. So we brought the finance folks to the supply chain and said, okay, I'll have the supply chain people work on, I mean, the clinical communities work on supply chain costs, but only if you agree to two principles, CFO. Number one is that physician choice will be maintained 
but it's maintained fully aware of what the opportunity is. If I go in and I force those doctors to say, you're now going to use these hip replacements, I will likely be wrong. I'll introduce harm, but more importantly, I will break their trust and they won't be energized like this. So they get to choose, but see what's on the table. Second principle is they get a piece of the savings. Not in their pocket, we have laws against that, but for better registries, for quality data, to support this enabling infrastructure, because they want to know how good they, they do. In our market, we have to demonstrate success, so then we market it for them to say, bring patients here, here's how good we are. We're demonstrating quality, not assuming quality, and we're learning, and it has just been radical. We drove, right now we're at about $60 million of supply chain costs this year out of our large system that we, that we fund this. People are publishing on these, they're engaged, and here's an example of this idea of creating structures to belong. We were way over transfusing people. We formed a transfusion clinical community where we looked at individual clinician transfusion thresholds. Very simple measure. What was the hemoglobin when you transfused, and how often did you give two units without checking a hemoglobin rather than one? A little slogan of why give two and one will do. And we reduced transfusions by about 20% in our health system. But our orthopedic surgeons were a little bit sticky. They didn't change their practices. And I don't know if there's any orthopedic surgeons in the room. They had this mental model that you need to transfuse at a hemoglobin of 10. And our administrators would always send out members, Don't, you're over transfusing, you're over transfusing, but it was done to them. What did we do? I simply connected the lead of the joint and knee, hip and knee replacement community with the transfusion community and said, could we have a conversation peer to peer? Because I think they have some knowledge that you could benefit from. Look, docs, here's what you're doing transfusing. Here's the evidence to say you don't need to do it. And overnight, you can see they essentially stopped transfusing, not because it was imposed on them, but because they told this new story together. Great example how we did the same thing with our colorectal surgeons. So our general surgeons had a really high SSI rate for colorectal surgeons. And when we started, what were they said? Peter, sometimes little girls like Josie are going to die. Or in other words, when you operate on the bowel, of course you're going to get surgical side infections. What are you, delusional? That's what happens when you cut when there's stool in there. We said, no, no, no. We can get to zero harm. Let's give it a shot and do it. And we got, now it's down to like 3% or 2.5%. But what was magical about it, as you probably know, the general surgeons aren't the only surgeons who do colorectal surgery, operate on the bowel. The gyne surgeons do a lot of that surgery in our health system. But they never talked to the general surgeons and they weren't part of this community. God knows why, because we're, we're so tribal. And so we simply said, hey, general surgeons, could you invite the guy in onc surgeons to come to your community? They don't need a different one, but they're doing the same thing. Their infection rates are sky high, and I think you guys could learn. So now our guy in onc rates, they're not quite down to the 2.5%, 3%, but they're down from 30 to 9 or 10%, and they're going down long. Same thing with our spine clinical community. We had neurosurgeons doing spine surgery and orthopedics never talk to each other, even though they're doing the same operation. So this you know, idea of creating structures for peer learning has been really, really powerful. So as we begin on this journey together and we say, what would it take to evolve a health system or a country to work from quality as a project? And you've been really good at that. You're the world leaders to quality as an integrated operating management system that lives those high reliability principles that eliminates all harm. What would that look like? How might you create this governance structure that functions just like finance, where you know any pocket that isn't performing well and you have accountability for that? That you create this shared leadership accountability, that you have this fractal management structure that you bring people together in communities, but you could literally cascade quality from board to bedside. How might we begin to create some standard work practices and ensuring competencies for this, not just, oh, I know how to do a PDSA cycle, but real competencies at a hierarchy of uh, levels. Let me give you one further example of standard work of how we did in your role as potential leaders. When we were on this journey, we realized that we're under financial pressures like you, and our leaders would make budget or operational cuts and not be mindful of the risks that those changes might introduce. So they may cut nurse budget. They may uh, change hours of a clinic. 
And so we started a program that whenever we make a significant operational or financial change, the leader has to write down on our quality dashboard what are the risks that might be imparted by that, how am I going to measure those risks, how am I going to defend those risks, and how do I know that I'm on a safe risk threshold? In other words, this, it's a bad decision to do this. Now, what was striking is I never said, we're not taking away your decision as leader to make that hard financial call. You have to make that call. We have to manage by budget. But you, I am going to say you need to be mindful of the risks you're introducing. When we first started this across our health system, I can't tell you how many leaders, CEOs, CFOs said, Peter, what are you talking about? I don't treat patients. I don't put risk into the system. I said, no, no, trust me, you do. You put risk or you defend against risk every day by the decisions you make about what to support, about the culture you create, and you need to start being accountable for those risks and being mindful of it, and it changes our game. So now everything at the table, our CFOs are saying, hey, you know, I, I think if we do this, we're going to put some risk. Is this really the right thing that, that uh, we need to do? But I want to end with perhaps the most important thing that we'd like you to do, and that is love. You see, when we think about what really drove those improvements in Clabsey, what frankly drives every improvement, it is what the psychologist Barbara Friedrichsen calls love. You see, she studies the biology of love. She wrote a book called Love 2.0, and looked at what makes oxytocin go up, that kind of the love hormone in people. And what she found was it's not a 50-year marriage. It's micro moments of positive connection between two or more people. But micro moments. I feel warm towards you. You feel warm towards me. And we connect. We create energy. So love is that hand on a worried patient. Love is listening to a colleague who's got a new idea to improve quality. Love is an arm around a colleague who just made a mistake. Love is walking down the hall and seeing the person scrubbing the room and saying, thank you for keeping us safe. You see, a big change is a sum of a thousand small ones. And every one of those small changes is made possible by creating these micro moments where we trust. And we know that these micro moments are infectious. They literally cascade through the organization. You may be aware of this literature. It's quite fascinating in sociology that if you put a thin person in a community, they are more likely to make everyone in that community thin, but not only that community, but the next community over and the next community over. Three degrees of separation, our behaviors impact. The same is with putting a jerk in a community, right? Which is why getting those untouchables addressed is really powerful. But the same is on love. I want to end with my story that I had about the power of infecting love and the power that's within all of us to change this culture. In our hospital, it's tradition that on Sunday mornings, the doctors often will buy bagels or donuts for the staff, uh, in, in this case, in the ICU. So last December, uh, or actually a Sunday just before September, a cold, snowy day in Baltimore, I stopped at the Dunkin' Donuts to get bagels and donuts for the staff. And this Dunkin' Donuts sits under the highway, and there's some steam vents uh, on the road, and so it's warm and dry, and a lot of homeless people congregate there. And so in this Dunkin' Donuts is this eclectic mixture of homeless people and people going about their work for Sunday morning. So doctors, nurses, policemen, Sunday school teachers in, 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 there, in there getting things. And it's about 50-50. And I'm standing in line and there was a homeless couple in front of me. I've never seen a couple and they were clearly in love. They are quite dirty, but they were really in love. And they were trying to save up enough money to buy the new heart-shaped Dunkin' Donut for Valentine's Day that has pink frosting on it. And, and they were about a nickel short. And so the woman turns around and says, hey, could you give us a nickel? And here I am feeling horrible to think I'm buying donuts for people who don't need donuts. And this is probably the only meal they're going to have their whole day. I said, you know what? Why don't you just go order breakfast? I'm getting a big order. Just tell them to put it on my tab and, and, and I'll, I'll get you both breakfast today. So they go up to order. And when they order, the guy taking their order must have thought he was going to be stiffed for the bill that they don't have the money. And so he said, no, you can't order that. 
And the guy stakes, makes kind of a scene of it and says, no, no, the guy behind me is buying me breakfast. And I said, yes, yes, I'm buying them breakfast. Let them get what they want. And there was a nurse standing next to me who said, wow, what a cool idea. Turns to the homeless person next to her and says, could I buy you breakfast? The cop next to her turns to the person and says, could I buy you breakfast? The Sunday school teacher turns next to her and says, hey, could I buy you breakfast? And this thing cascaded seven people deep within like 30 seconds. Right? It was the most breathtaking example of our ability to create these little micro moments that I've ever seen. And I was quite moved. And I was walking out of the Dunkin' Donuts. They were sitting eating their breakfast. And the guy says, can I speak with you for a minute? And I said, sure. And he said, you know, I'm not a nobody. Uh, I made bad decisions in my life, but I'm getting my act back together. And I said, I believe me, I know you're not a nobody. I, I b believe you're going to be successful. And I believe so much that do me a favor. When you get successful, buy somebody else breakfast. He said, okay. Well, about two months ago, Sunday morning, I'm back in the ICU. I go to stop at Dunkin' Donuts, and the cashier says, hey, this guy left you a note, this little crinkled piece of paper written on pencil that said, I bought somebody breakfast today. Right? Really remarkable thing. I was quite moved by that. And I went to rounds in the ICU and started talking about love. Now, you don't have to know Johns Hopkins, but love isn't the most common topic of, <laughs> of rounds in our ICU. And, but we try to practice this principle of respect. So the on rounds, we invite the environmental services, patients, families, because we all need to work together. And one of our own workers, our own environmental workers on rounds, teared up and said to me, do you know, Peter, I used to be one of those homeless people at that Dunkin' Donuts. And what I would have given for someone to believe in me. Right? And it was this great closure of this cascade to say, if we want to create the health system that our patients deserve, that we all desire, and frankly the public is demanding, it's going to start with all of us committing to our personal I will statements to kind of create this culture of respect and the structures for us to have peer learning community. And I believe with that, your staff are smart enough to figure out the process stuff, but that's our job to begin to do this. Because you see, the question that Sorrel King asked me about, is her daughter less likely to die? I believe she's asking every one of you, and she deserves an answer. So thank you, and I think hopefully we have a couple minutes for questions.